lane. <laughs> How's everybody? Well, I want to hear a couple more screams, all right? Throughout this, uh, wow, I don't know what, which one of that was uh, for. <laughs> Definitely, probably for, for John over here. It, it helps that we're both named John, doesn't it? Okay, so uh, you guys, um, John's an expert over here uh, about marketing automation. We're going to be talking about that. What do you guys want to learn today? Come on, what do you guys want to learn? Give me, give me a couple things. Integration. Integration. Market. Market. Oh, come on. <laughs> what? Exponential growth. Exponential growth. Exponential what else? Growth. Client funnels. What is? Future of automation. Oh, that's good, because that's what the session title is. Yeah, that's, that's what go. the session title is. Okay, you guys, um, Paying attention. just to let you guys know, we're going, I will be checking my watch. It's not just for text messaging, although that might be one of them. Um, my thing cut out for some reason. Uh, hopefully, yep, there it went. Um, we're going to leave about five to ten minutes at the very end of this, this uh, panel for questions. So if you guys have questions, um, we're going to be doing that. If there's a pressing question that you guys want answered at the time, like he's saying something you guys need, just raise your hand and I'll try and call you guys out in the audience to ask your question. I want this to be very interactive. Good? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. John, tell us a little bit about your background. How, how did you get started? Sure. Uh, so I was in management consulting for a long time. Um, and I've got a background in math, a background in applied math. So my background was really just helping folks solve really complicated decision-making problems. I ended up at MailChimp as their chief data scientist. Uh, MailChimp is swimming in data because we have millions of small businesses doing marketing through us. Uh, built a bunch of data products for MailChimp. And the process of building a data product for a small business is kind of interesting because small businesses don't have time to understand data science. So it was really just a product management task. And after I did that for a number of years, um, I just started doing it for the whole product. Uh, so at this point, my job is really shaping the MailChimp product roadmap, figuring out we, what we build next for customers, making sure that they can effectively sort of build their brand, sell more stuff. I assume that's why y'all are here, is to learn a little bit about that. Uh, that's sort of my story in a nutshell. Cool. So. Uh, just kind of uh, for the audience, what is people in the audience? I assume most people in this audience are startups, one to ten people. What are they doing wrong? What's the biggest thing that you see small business owners when they're first getting started? What are they doing wrong? <laughs> I, I'm not going to accuse anyone of doing anything wrong. You can accuse wrong, me because I have done every negative thing in the book. But I, I you know, I. So I, I looked at, uh, back in grad school, I did a lot of stuff around how to make a, how to make a decision. And you start to learn that um, people get really interested in sort of one thing, and they end up overvaluing that thing and undervaluing a lot of other stuff, even though they claim to value it. So like a, a classic example is when you talk to people about buying a car, and you say, what's interesting to you about buying a car? Um, they'll say, oh, you know, fuel economy and all this stuff, but then when you actually dig into what drove their, per their purchase behavior, it was actually the cup holders, right? How many cup holders it has and where they, they were. Um, That's and it's very sort of important <laughs> to my wife. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually, it was a truly decision that was number one on her list, seven cup holders. It, it's important because you never throw away, I never like throw away or clean cups, just leave them in there until yeah. they all pile up, so I need a million. Yes. Um, but I think the same thing happens with startups uh, where you have a thing that you're proud of, right? You have a product or a service that you really care about. And so you end up shaping everything you do and everything you think about is like, this product, how do I make it better? But in order for it to take off, and this is sort of where marketing comes in, you've got to not only build this product and build this brand, but find an audience, right? Which is perhaps not what you want to do. And then actually connect the audience to the product, which is marketing. And a lot of what I find uh, from startups and founders, founders often have to do their own marketing, is they just really don't give a shit about marketing. And I get it, right? Because you want to get back to your product yep. or perhaps the content that's a stand-in for your product, not necessarily the sort of the wiring up of this product to people out there, right? It, it can feel like a chore. It can feel like a distraction. Um, and so it's not really a mistake. But it is finding time to do marketing when it's, it's really not your passion. And I feel like this is one thing that MailChimp has learned and totally gets, which is like, 
all right, you may have to do marketing even though it is not your passion, even though you're not a marketer. So we've been shaping our product sort of around that idea, which is mark everyone has to do marketing. If you're a startup, you have to do it, and you're probably not a marketer. And it's, it's not necessarily a mistake, but it's something just to be aware of. You should make time for this thing. So I, I, I just want to share a personal story really quick that, uh, on caring about marketing. So you guys, when I first got started in blogging, I, I blog a lot. And when, when I first got started, I, I put up a, pl a blog because everybody makes bl money blogging, right? Everybody makes money blogging, right? Right? Come on, millions, right? So I put up this blog <laughs> and... I started blogging three times a day, and nine months in, you guys, I did this for nine months. Think how many hundreds of blog posts I've written. I had not made one dollar. And so I went, I went to a buddy, and I said, hey, you know, what am I doing wrong? And he looked at my blog, and he saw, well, you know, probably the first step to earning money would be you want to place an ad on your site, <laughs> like a place where people can purchase an ad. And I was like, I am an idiot. You guys, we're, we're a lot like this in the marketing world, and I, I feel like so many of us are so concerned and so like our, our startup is our world. It's our passion. It's everything that we do, everything that we are, and we're missing so much. So, you know, in this thing, and what would you say is the number one thing startups are missing? Like, what are they forgetting to do when they get started that just sets them up for not failure, but like not as much success as they could have? Yeah, so um, to use your blog as an example, uh, startups in sort of in their early days, right, they, they can get pretty good about producing content, maybe driving some traffic to their site, right? There, there are ways to do this, whether it's having a blog and doing some SEO stuff or doing social posting or doing influencer marketing where you maybe find some micro-influencers and get them to support your product and, you know, push, push folks to your site. There are a lot of ways to eventually get folks to your website or get them to do, you know, look at you a little bit. Um, but before you engage in that, I think a lot of people forget to wire their site up with everything that they need to turn those people that might be taking a look at you into someone who's known in some way or known a little bit more than they were prior to just looking at your website, right? Um, so on the sort of less known end, it would be things like, cookieing so that you can do retargeting and ads. How many people like cookies? I love cookies. Cookies are great. Um, How many people have cookies on their site right now tracking user behavior and what's going on? You guys, that's literally less than 10% of the audience. <laughs> this is like one of his number one things. Make sure you're enabling cookies on your site so you track the people that are coming to your site so you can retarget them, remarket them, and know what's actually going on behind the scenes. Yeah, a, a stat we were just looking at this morning, 97% um, of folks who visit an e-commerce site uh, do not actually check out or sort of make a transaction, right? They're, they're scoping out your product. They're thinking about it. And so if you're not um, cooking them to present things like retargeting ads or remarketing ads is what Google calls them, you're missing out perhaps on having another way to reach out to them. Uh, in a similar vein, uh, it's a great opportunity to ask for an email address, right? Because if you can convert someone from a site visitor who you don't really know into an email address where you do actually have some information about them and can reach out in a more personalized way, uh, your chances of converting them are just that much better. And so I just I would urge folks who, okay, I've got a product, and now I just want to I just want to throw messages out into the ether, right? I want to get on, you know, whatever the networks are that apply to you, whether it's Twitter or Twitch. I just want to get out there and you know have ways that I'm either going to talk about it or influencers are going to talk about it on my behalf. Before you do that, make sure you've sort of set up what you need to make the most out of those visitors. It would be strange if you were like, okay, I've got this super great fishing net and I'm gonna bring some fish into my boat, but I forgot that there's a big hole in the middle of my boat and when I dump out the fish, they fall back in the water. You don't do that. Uh, so I'd encourage you to not do that with your website. Did you have a question? So, so basically, based on what you said, would, would you wanna say that reten the retention of those clients would be by, by continuously him trying to pull them back into the site, but how would you hold them based on MailChimp services? 
how do you intend to hold them if such a big percentage are just scoping so they're not really yet interested so yeah. it does does the continuousness of, of, of you pulling in their social media or, or receiving emails yeah I'll, I'll repeat the question as well so does, does doesn't that also discourage them from from coming to your site? Yeah, so the, the question was is when you're doing cookies and when you're getting these people into your site um, and you're funneling them, um, is you remarketing and retargeting and pulling on all their feeds, doesn't it discourage them after time from coming back? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, thanks for bringing it up. I, I do talk to a lot of small businesses and startups who, who feel this way, which is, um, you know, usually it's like, I don't want to be annoying, right? I mean, that's how we feel. I get annoyed by ads, I get annoyed by emails, and I get it. Um, I come from a background where one of the things I had to do was uh, I did a bunch of models around pricing stuff. So how do you automatically price cruise ship berths? I called cruise ships boats for a second in front of like a cruise ship company and got, they got really mad at me. Cruise ships, how do you price them? How do you price hotel rooms, et cetera? And one thing that I learned was you know, as you raise prices uh, or lower prices, you have this interesting effect. So if I have a, if I have a price, I'm going to lower it. Uh, demand will go up. And at some point, I reach a revenue sweet spot. And then I've lowered prices so much that my revenue goes down. Because while demand is increasing, I'm getting less bang for my buck, literally. Um, and I get less revenue. So there's like this sweet spot, right? And what I've found is with marketing, what data shows us is there's a sweet spot as well where you can eventually over-market and over-communicate. However, 90% of the businesses that we talk to are nowhere near that sweet spot. They haven't crossed over into some point where they're talking too much to potential prospects and customers. Usually, they're too afraid to do that, and they're on the other end of like, ah, I don't want to bother people, so I'm just going to email them once a month, and I'm just going to do this ad. Um, folks don't realize how many times it takes uh, communicating with someone before maybe a message even registers, right? Sure, I get emailed with some of the promotional, uh, I get annoyed with some of the promotional email that I get, but usually I don't even notice a brand until you know a few times. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I did want to look at that, um, and it, it's rare that someone like actually annoys me. I, I would also say if you're if you're annoying somebody, most likely they're not going to be a customer anyways. Right. So I wouldn't really worry too much about it. Um, kind of going in, because that's getting more into the actual automation. So what are your top three like automations? Like how do I start automating my marketing, freeing up a little bit of my time? What would be your top three automations that you see uh, that MailChimp does or businesses enabling on MailChimp that really, really works well? Y'all can, okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about marketing funnels, which I apologize for going to talk about marketing funnels. I know no one Boring. Really, really wants to talk about this. We did have a question about that earlier. Funnels. Let's talk about funnels. Funnel cakes are much more fun than funnels. Um, but when you're thinking about marketing automation, think about sort of there are a bunch of people out there who are unknown, and then they become more known to me and how can I set up automations at each step along the way to help me out because if, if you run a startup, if you have a small business, you have basically jack shit for time, right? And so think about automation as something that has a couple of advantages. One, you can speak to people in a personalized way and two, the system can speak to someone on your behalf, so you don't have to sit there and craft every message at the right time and send to the right person on your own. You'll have a system do it for you. So it should free you up, and it should actually convert better. Um, so sort of at the top of the funnel, these are people who I don't quite know yet. That's where things like remarketing ads come in, right? They visited my site, and I'm going to drive them back into my site. You also should start thinking about converting people into things like uh, phone numbers or email addresses, et cetera, where I can start reaching out to them in a more one-to-one -one manner. And so then as they get sort of further down the funnel, that's where you're thinking about uh, remarketing email, abandoned cart email is an obvious one for e-commerce. And even if you don't actually have a product, there is some version of abandoned cart for you, right? So it, it could just be abandoned browse. 
And so see, if you're like, if you're putting a hierarchy, you say first kind of put a cookie on your site, yes. making sure you're tracking user yep. behavior. Next, you're, you're trying to collect an email in some way, shape, or form from a customer. That's and right. then you're remarketing to those people on like Facebook, Google Ads, other things based on an email. So it's much more targeted to an individual layer. And then what's next? Yes. Yeah, in, so in kind of your order hierarchy. Yes. Yeah, you know, so funneling down that funnel. The, then it's sort of as you go further down, you want to think about these are people that have now converted and they are your, more, your most valuable folks. So don't just hang out sort of at the top of the funnel where you're trying to bring new people in. If you have people that have converted, whatever converted means for you, whether it's made a purchase or reached out about your product or they've used your service, um, talk to those folks more. Right, so find ways to keep them informed about new things you're doing, get them to come back and repurchase, thank them, uh, offer them offers, make sure that they don't lapse. If you're at an early stage where you don't have a huge customer base, even if you're B2C, you might wanna think about acting like a B2B business, which is to say, perhaps a personal touch, calling people up on the phone until that doesn't scale. Uh, once it doesn't scale, you need to actually have sort of a come to Jesus moment where you think about, am I the type of business that actually scales that personal touch, like sales or not? Uh, but in the early days, that's something you should you know, perhaps think about is like reaching out. Do you, do you guys know Product Hunt? You guys heard of Product Hunt? Woo! Yeah, do you guys like that company? Do you guys know he called personally the first 2,000 customers on the phone? I was one of the first 100 customers. He called me up personally on the phone and asked me, why I was using the product, how I was using the product, and you guys, I'm, I'm only the hundredth person to ever sign up, which is pretty awesome that I signed up for that that early. But he personally reached out and was like, hey, I want to know how you're using this, why you're using it. And then almost every year to the date, he's called me up and been like, what are you using it for now? What are you using this now? Until he sold it, which after he sold it, he still called me up on the phone. Been like, you were one of my first hundred customers. Why are you still using it? And that's some of, you guys know how successful that company's been. The, he's still contacting me. I, I, I just can't stress how important like these follow up and this funnel, like the more, like obviously, you know, it starts with, you know, cookie, then goes email, then goes this, then goes contacting. And like I'm down here in the far funnel and I feel those are some of your most loyal customers and you can contact them all the time and they love and they're passionate about what you're doing. You Almost everything you put in front of them, you can buy. They yeah, will buy. It's a, it's a great place to generate really good customer feedback. Um, and, you know, I know I, I, I touched on email, but gathering those folks' identities, understanding who they are, is just helpful across every channel, right? It could be direct mail, right? We have a lot of folks who send, who literally just send personalized postcards as a way to do that. And in fact, there are automation solutions for that as well. MailChimp is releasing one in a few months. Um, or it could, be, it could be syncing up you know, your list over to a social network like, like Facebook, like Instagram, so that you can actually target these folks with uh, highly targeted ads or even using them as a lookalike audience. So as you eventually grow that base of people that you know, they become a stand-in for your intuition about who you think your customer is, right? When you're first starting your business, you just have to make up kind of bullshit about who you think your customer is. Uh, we've seen this with some of our brands. One of them uh, uh, that uses us is a brand called Everly. They, they make, uh, it's basically water. Uh, and they thought their customer was uh, a very particular gender, age, interest, et cetera, and they tried to reach out via interest-based advertising, right, on social networks. Oh, they like this, they are this, uh, and they got it wrong. But over time, they built up customers, they knew who they were, they then synced that list over to places like Facebook and built lookalike audiences off of it, and it does a lot better because you go from a place where you're theorizing, which usually means you say, my customer is me, right? You just think, oh, they all look like me. That turns out to be wrong most of the time. And as you sort of gain a base, you know, maybe it's only 200 people, but it's like, these are the folks who are actually interested. Not only do you talk to them one-on-one -on -one and learn a lot, but you then also use them as a seed to find more people like them. And there are more people like them. So that's another thing that I would encourage you to do. Yeah, just know also that your customer will evolve and become a different person over time. 
your customer from two years ago is going to eventually change a little bit and evolve into what your company will actually be. Uh, they, they will essentially pivot as your company changes and makes more evolutions. Okay, we have a couple more, uh, a couple minutes for audience questions. Does anybody have questions right there? Okay. Yeah, so the question is on personalization. There's a lot of people talking about personalization. Personalization is not just your name. Um, so what's MailChimp doing on that? Yeah, so I think, I think you sort of noted in the hierarchy sort of the simple stuff, right? Which is like, okay, uh, at its most basic, maybe some sort of automated marketing is essentially merging in details about yourself. Uh, like, oh, it actually says, hi, John, when you deliver the email. Okay, great. Um, Next step would be basically triggers based on sort of context, right? Contextual information. This is where dropping cookies becomes so important is you don't just want to have some details about a person in your CRM. You want to know what they just did so that you can speak to them at the right time. This is sort of where that life cycle automation comes in. We say, okay, this person just converted. So maybe it's time to ask for a review. This person hasn't bought from me in three months. Maybe it's time to reach out with a deal or to say something interesting or new to them. Right? Or this person just lapsed. What can I do with that? So that's sort of the next step in the hierarchy. And then the third step, and this is the one that takes the most amount of time, is content. Right? So is thinking about how do I make content dynamic? And that could be um, escalating deals, et cetera, that actually apply to them based on their customer lifetime value. Right? So using things like predicted customer lifetime value. Uh, those are directions that MailChimp is headed in. The nice thing about understanding someone's context, what they just did on your site, what they just purchased, it will help you with content. And that's a big deal. Um, a lot of startups don't have a lot of time to actually like craft, craft messages just out of the blue, right? And so if you know what someone just did, that's going to help you write this thing. Obviously, if they just looked at a particular product, you can reach back out and talk about that product. Uh, and we find that those things are highly, highly successful, right? So uh, the obvious one is abandoned cart. Uh, we find that businesses that turn it on get an extra 600 bucks a month in revenue just from having that thing on. It's literally five minutes of work. Um, so things like that are where you start. Um, and I think what we're going to see out of MailChimp and just in the industry in the future is marketing automation started really with email. That's sort of a big one, right? But it's going to expand to other channels. So think about marketing automation for direct mail and treating direct mail like an ad network or uh, greater marketing automation, uh, more targeting over ad networks, um, perhaps you know, programmatic television. Um, and it just goes on and on. Dynamic content on your site. Um, this is something we're looking at democratizing the small businesses. So things like buy-alongs, things like out-of-stock automations, et cetera. So that's sort of where I see things headed is taking these things, getting better dynamic content, expanding them into sort of more places and more channels. All right, we have, we have time for one more question, and I'm going to do it up there. I'm sorry. Up there, middle. So there's a lot of companies out there competing against MailChimp. Some of them are pretty awesome. Others, not so much. <laughs> What's MailChimp doing? I can to, answer that. Yeah. Because I, I own the roadmap at MailChimp. And you have one minute. I have one minute. Okay. 30 so seconds. So MailChimp is, is sort of dedicated to the uh, startup small business space, right? So everything that we're doing is focused on how do we get smaller companies to use the same technologies that enterprise companies have, which means yeah. having the same powerful technology, but basically uh, orchestrate it in a way where you can turn it on really easily, uh, recipeize it, and not necessarily need a marketing team to run it because it's basically a Frankenstein's monster of shitty acquisitions. Um, so we don't want that. We don't want that, even if you think you do. Um, and so where we're headed with this is we do see actually in the small business space a lot of essentially features that pop up. They call themselves companies, but they're features. They do one marketing automation thing, and that is it. And that's great, 
right? Like, okay, you just do pop-up sign-up forms, fine. Uh, you just do buy-alongs or you just do discounts, fine. You do giveaways and automations off of giveaways, fine. That's all great. Uh, what, uh, what MailChimp is doing is thinking about which one of the, which of all of these marketing automation tasks are actually valuable to small businesses, they actually work, and how do we bring them all into one place inside of one marketing platform? And the reason why you want to bring them into one platform, there's, there's actually a bunch of reasons, it's we can make a better UX for them, but more importantly, we can make all of that data live in one place. Because when you think about marketing automation, it shouldn't just be like, oh, I do this one task over here, I do this other task over here. It should be about how all of these things connect. So for example, I might want to do a giveaway uh, prior to, let's say prior to the holiday season, I want to do a giveaway. Uh, that would involve standing up a landing page where people are going to sign up for my giveaway. But prior to that, I'm going to run an ad that's going to drive people to that landing page. After that landing page and after the sign up, not only am I going to give away whatever I'm giving away, I also want to have an email automation that introduces them to other products, et cetera. Ten seconds. And so, I got 10 seconds. So where we think the future is headed is not just standing up these individual features, that's fine, but actually hooking them in, together in a way that makes sense and using recipes that, uh, that startups can actually employ very quickly so they can get back to the other things they're doing. Thank you, that was awesome. Hey you guys, let's give John, he's also uh, Thanks, personally looking to purchase every single one of your companies, so I'm just joking, he's not. Hey, thanks you guys for coming. Have a great day.